again welcome back to the latest lecture session again a quick recap of what we have been up to so in the context of groundwater remediation we were discussing permeable reactive barriers and i guess we spent considerable time in understanding uh, how to or what are the relevant aspects we need to look at when we are looking at prbs right and what are the different kinds of prbs right and also what are the different types of reactive uh, media that you choose obviously how would you choose the reactive media depending upon the type of contaminant so for example if it's halocarbon or the chlorinated solvents or such let's say which are oxidized contaminants you are going to choose a reducing agent let's say a zero valent iron right and if it's let's say acid you are going to have to provide a base to be able to neutralize that so if you have acid and uh, the base you are looking for obviously limestone and uh, similar such aspects we discuss them right and we moved on to also looking at let's say what are some of the cases when this uh, prb might not work or when the efficiency might be relatively less and we looked at let's say a particular uh, graph right similar to this particular case yes we looked at this so obviously as you see in the aerobic uh, case yes the electron acceptor preferable electron acceptor would be oxygen and not let's say any of the other compounds that you would have out here right and also we talked about the redox potential briefly right as an if eh not is greater than eh not of or eh not of 1 let's say is greater than eh not of 2 let's say this one will stay as or will be uh, the reduction and the other one will go as or proceed as oxidation as in as you see the half reactions are, are written as reduction yes so when you say eh1 is greater than eh2 and for example let's look at two cases here so this is 1 and this is 2 right so if i what do i see here obviously i see that eh0 of this particular half reaction is greater than eh0 of this particular half reaction right so in that case uh, this particular reaction would proceed as is and this reaction would proceed in this particular direction yes so again uh, obviously uh, different uh, cases and such yes and uh, or you know a better case would be an example would be this rather than this hydrogen sulfide let's say yes and let's say oxygen so you have let's say oxygen water some so4 2 minus and some hs minus right so typically i should not look at the standard uh, redox potentials i need to calculate eh1 and eh2 right considering the actual concentrations of o2 so4 2 minus and hs minus then if eh1 is greater than eh2 what would happen uh, oxygen will be reduced by hs minus as in this reaction will proceed in this direction and this reaction will proceed in this direction as in how is this going to help us let's say it's going to help us in identifying which particular uh, what do you say half reaction would proceed as oxidation which one would go as reduction as in what was th that mean as in which compound will reduce which particular compound yes so that's what uh, you are going to be able to understand so in this context obviously we also looked at the other aspects let's say if i had zero valent iron and let's say i have both uh, so4 2 minus that i want to let's say reduce to hs minus and i also have water in the solution at the same time obviously you know the preferable electron uh, acceptor would be oxygen again because greater energy would be released from that particular half reaction so obviously if the conditions are highly aerobic uh, feasibility of zero valent iron based prbs or reduction based prbs are going to be an issue so obviously you would want anaerobic conditions right where it's possible though so but obviously we do not know where the eh0 or eh values fall so typically we have the relevant optimal range so that's where somewhere uh, way down out here though right so that's something that we can look at to understand the relevant system or look at the feasibility yes and then obviously the redox reactions so we looked at this briefly so we are looking for strong reducing agents right what is a reducing agent something that will donate its or wants to donate its electron or an electron so typically we look at zero valent iron right and that can what do we say be oxidized to fe2 plus by releasing two electrons or uh, be oxidized to fe3 plus releasing three electrons right so typically though we know that fe3 plus will not stay as fe3 plus it's going to precipitate out and that's the relevant reaction that we see here as in this is a solid that's going to be precipitated out right uh, fe not uh, oxidized to fe3 plus fe3 plus then precipitating out and the process you see that the electrons are being released and again h plus is also being released meaning ph will uh, fall right so typically when we have zero valent iron these are the aspects we need to consider as in we can have reduction right 
of the relevant contaminant and we can also have co-precipitation by the relevant compound being adsorbed onto this particular uh, precipitate of uh, ferric hydroxide right. So, typically you can observe either reduction or co-precipitation in this case of zero valent iron based PRBs right. So, moving on but what is the one particular aspect with respect to co-precipitation right. The issue is that let us say this is the initial case and with time let us say yes I have this particular graph here. So, with time this is the uh, changing scenario. So, these are my zero valent iron particles let us say and I have TC let us say chlorinated solvent right trichloroethylene I believe and so this contaminant is flowing through this particular PRB and coming in contact obviously with zero valent iron and it is going to be reduced to ethene ok. So, that is what you would ideally want to have, but over time what would happen right you are going to have build up of this particular ferric hydroxide which we saw would be formed this particular ferric hydroxide would build up over the particular particles yes. So, you would have build up of these particular ferric hydroxide uh, precipitates building you know uh, occupying the relevant surface area or precipitating out on the surface area of this zero valent iron particles. So, what are the relevant aspects that are going to be involved? So, one particular aspect is that now the time let us say would be less than what you would expect or want let us say right. Again why is that the porosity is going to decrease let us say yes and it can decrease much further as you see right. So, in this case let us say the particle or the TCE compound would spend more time in the relevant reactor here relatively less and here much lesser I guess yes. So, obviously what does that mean the TCE does not have relevant or enough time to react with the relevant uh, PRB or pardon me in this case zero valent iron molecule right. So, potential effects so obviously you need to take this into account when you are designing the thickness of the PRB or designing the PRB right. So, moving on. So, what are the other uh, contaminants that we uh, typically look at one case obviously is that uh, we look at chlorinate solvents, but obviously when you are looking at uh, uh, considering zero valent iron which is what we are going to discuss in greater detail again why is that because it is widely used obviously we are looking for oxidized contaminants or oxidants. So, in this case typically chlorinated organics. So, here I have uh, chlorinated organics right and chlorinated organics there are two different pathways as in one is the hydrogen lysis hydrogen lysis and the other is the beta elimination. So, let us just look at that and then we are going to move on and understand why we need to look at these two aspects too right. So, two different pathways for degradation of this hydro chlorinated solvent as is represented here let us say right. So, here you have uh, hydrogen being consumed let us say H plus being consumed and again two electrons being accepted and then relevant reduction of the relevant compound and then release of this particular Cl minus. So, again hydrogen lysis yes here the key is that for each Cl right chloride uh, ion you need two electrons right two electrons per Cl and also the case is that it tends to consume pH right uh, pardon me not consume pH consume H plus as you can see out here what does that mean pH rises right. So, pH rises again what issues would that cause it can cause issues with relevant precipitation right typically at higher uh, pH you can have precipitation of the relevant metals and so on right. So, that is one particular case you need to observe or consider and the other pathway is the beta elimination as you can see here elimination step wise we are going to look at that. So, as we see here two electrons and two Cl minus being released and here you have the reduced compound. So, again one electron per Cl minus required is re are required or is required pardon me and as you see H plus is not involved in this particular reaction. So, thus uh, you know pH is not affected here right. So, let us look at the relevant compound here. So, here I have TCE right. So, it carbon carbon double bond double bond here H Cl 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 right. So, I have three uh, chlorines here right and so there are two different pathways obviously one is the hydrogen lysis which is this particular pathway and the other is the beta elimination which is this pathway right. So, obviously what do you see here so two electrons and H plus accepted and Cl minus is given out let us say and that is where now you end up with uh, two H uh, two uh, hydrogen atoms here and again Cl right. What is it now the net effect is that obviously this is a relatively more reduced compound compared to TC and then further degradation 
or for the acceptance of electrons and H plus and so on and so forth and you end up with relatively more degraded products or uh, reduced products. So, here is my initial compound and from hydrogenolysis pathway I form first form DCE, vinyl chloride, ethene and then ethane if the reaction goes to the furthest extent right. And then the second case is when I have beta elimination and it goes from TCE, chloroacetylene, acetylene and then ethene and ethane right. So, here let us look at that. So, 2 electrons uh, are accepted and 2 Cl minus given out and that is what you see out here right. Instead of 3 out here you now have uh, only 1 Cl minus 2 Cl minus are released and then obviously the triple bond here obviously right. So, again the key here is that the re aspect uh, to understand again is that here you have 2 different pathways meaning you can have different kinds of byproducts depending upon the kind of pathway. But why do we obviously need to look at this or understand? The key is that when you are degrading a toxic compound right depending upon either the extent to which you are degrading it let us say or the pathway you can end up forming more toxic compounds as in as we look at it here if we follow the hydrogen lysis pathway what we observe DCE a toxic compound vinyl chloride which is a carcinogenic and certainly a toxic compound right are formed right probably a carcinogenic I am not uh, uh, 100 percent confident but I it is remarkably toxic right. So, the key is that depending upon the pathway or the ratio or the rate at which the two pathways are carried out let us say right you need to also consider the effects of these particular byproducts right as in you cannot let us say just say I am going to remove TCE but end up having a lot of vinyl chloride in your particular uh, treated water right why is that vinyl chloride is more toxic than your TCE right. So, your design should also be able to take into account further degradation of vinyl chloride into ethene, ethane or you know the more uh, what we say benevolent uh, or non harmful compounds or non toxic compounds pardon me right. So, that is one aspect to look at. So, again what are the other contaminants again as we mentioned oxidants. So, typically nitrate again right methemoglobinemia I guess right uh, blue baby syndrome pardon me. So, and again it ha it can accept electrons right and you know ammonia is formed obviously again the key is that it increases pH. So, again electron donor right. So, what do you need for that? You need an electron acceptor. What is the electron acceptor? 0 valent iron right. So, that is something you see nitrate and again chromium here as I mentioned earlier the oxidation state is plus 6 and this state CrO4 2 minus after the 0 valent iron provides the relevant electrons and you know H plus is consumed. Let us say you are going to have uh, oxygen state plus 3 here for the chromium right and that as we know is relatively more insoluble and that is why you see the relevant precipitation here. And again as you see H plus is also being consumed that would obviously increase the pH right. So, again oxygen again can act as an interfering compound right say right. So, what do we see here oxygen can consume 4 electrons and again H plus and be reduced to H 2 right again interfering compound. So, again hydrogen ions let us say again uh, the key is that the hydrogen can be used by microorganisms to reduce nitrate and sulphide right. So, in the in some cases when 0 valent iron does not play a direct role it can play an indirect role by promoting formation of hydrogen let us say which is required by some microorganisms to promote reduction of nitrate and sulphide let us say right. Again what is the pathway H plus being reduced to H 2 here right or a different pathway H 2 O I guess obviously uh, I mean just uh, another form of writing this particular reaction right and H 2 will be useful for the relevant microorganisms right. So, different contaminants and we looked at some of the different cases, but the key aspect is that they are all electron acceptors here right. So, moving on. So, column tests why do we do the column tests I guess we are trying to look at uh, an idea or get an idea about the kinetics and once I get the an idea about the kinetics what can I decide I can design the thickness of the relevant PRB right. So, that is the case here. So, for that I obviously need the rate constants right and that will help me calculate the thickness of the relevant reactive medium yes. So, kinetics uh, plays an important role right. So, here we are typically for talking about redox reactions right redox reactions right and as we know or people who have some background redox reactions rarely reach equilibrium, but uh, it is the key aspect that we need to consider in redox reactions is the kinetics or are the kinetics right. Kinetics will give an idea about how fast the relevant process occur right or the rate of change of those particular uh, chemical process and equilibrium will give you an idea about how far the system can travel let us say or 
what is the maximum extent that the system can travel to let us say right. So, typically in redox reactions we are uh, considering or we need to look at kinetics right. So, obviously in this context as we discussed earlier if we have A and B going to products right the rate of the relevant reaction is the rate constant of this particular reaction K times concentration of A concentration of B right. So, here we have 0 valent iron and B is your contaminant let us see and this is my reaction. So, but obviously here the key is that it is a surface reaction yes as in you have 0 valent iron let us say pellets and you have the contaminant coming in contact. So, it is a surface reaction. So, the relevant aspect is that uh, rather than concentration expressed in the traditional units we are going to look at A here which is the surface area per volume of water surface area of 0 valent iron per volume of water right. And obviously, what will the surface area depend upon? It is going to be depend upon concentration of 0 valent iron into specific surface area A s is the specific surface area which will give you an idea about surface area per mass right. As in greater surface area of the relevant compound per mass let us say you will have obviously greater uh, so what do we say sites for uh, reaction. But obviously way too uh, typically when would that occur as in you when would you have greater surface area for a given mass when the particle size is less, but obviously we have limitations with respect to the size as in if you go for way too uh, lesser size particles the porosity let us say or the hydraulic conductivity of your permeable reactive barrier might be less or there might be issues obviously you can have slurry and such. So, you have way too uh, small particles there are other issues practical issues again with respect to precipitation and then blockage of the relevant pores. So, it is a balance between these two aspects right. So, here what do we have we have uh, surface area per volume of water what is that depend upon obviously the concentration of 0 valent iron times the specific surface area right. So, as we mentioned earlier though typically we put in a lot of 0 valent iron right typically it is in great stoichiometric excess right. So, this means for all practical purposes this particular value is constant. So, what can I express this as K dash into concentration of B right. So, that what is this it is first order or pseudo first order even though it is supposed to be 0 order. So, it is typically expressed as pseudo first order here right. So, that is what we see here. So, R equal to K dash times C, C is the concentration of the contaminant and what is K dash? K dash is K times 0 valent iron concentration into specific surface area right into concentration of the contaminant yes. So, this is what it is, but obviously most of these are constant and that is why we end up using the pseudo first order rate constant here right. So, that is with respect to kinetics and we are going to look at this again later when we need to understand let us say how to design this particular PRB right. So, let us uh, move on again. So, one aspect here is uh, we come back to this figure which we looked at earlier. So, if you remember let us say uh, the uh, case was that as I go from this particular case when all the site is available to the 0 valent iron uh, what do we say having some precipitation on the relevant site and now let us say the PRB material ha does not hold the relevant compound for as long as it would in this case let us say. So, lesser time here and much lesser time here right. So, that would affect my kinetics that is one way right. So, the time available is or you know as time progresses let us say I am going to have the relevant particle uh, or the residence time of the relevant particle in the PRB to be relatively less that is something we discussed earlier. But obviously, what is one other aspect or how can it also affect uh, what we say the kinetics of the relevant reaction. One way obviously as we discussed was the time itself available for the relevant uh, what we say compound in the PRB is less, but what is the second way as we looked at it earlier. So, R is dependent upon this particular specific surface area available right. So, here as you see the specific surface area available here right is different from what would be available here after certain time t right as in now initially you had only 0 valent iron and all the surface uh, is available or is active right. But after precipitation of let us say ferric hydroxide or other precipitates on this 0 valent iron the specific surface area is less let us say you know or would be less after some time right. So, obviously, what would the case turn out to be your K dash times C which is K times concentration of 0 valent iron times specific surface area times concentration right. So, this particular value is or can decrease over time right and thus your particular rate rate of your particular reaction 
can be lesser. So, this particular aspect also needs to be taken into account when you are designing for the thickness of the relevant PRB, right. So, again uh, we are going to move on. So, here obviously we as we talked earlier we can have byproducts formed that are relatively toxic or even sometimes more toxic than the parent compound. So, here the key aspect is uh, let us first understand the figure we have on the y axis concentration in PPB uh, for different compounds and on the x axis we have the residence time let us say right. And so, initially let us say I have concentration of TCE to be 1000 PPB and you know this is the profile that would be for different retention times let us say right. And I guess the regulatory standard would be where is the regulatory standard for T TCE out here. So, this is the regulatory standard. So, if I just uh, you know degrade the compound to this particular concentration you know which is I believe 5 ppb for TC I meet the relevant standard right. So, if I go from 1000 to 5 ppb which would require time of T1 let us say I am fine with meeting the regulatory standard for TC though. But as you know depending on the pathway right hydrogen lysis or beta elimination we have these more toxic compounds being formed right. What do you observe here as TC is decreasing you now have increase of or formation of these byproducts right which are vinyl chloride and 1 2 DC. So, if I stop my particular or design my particular system such that it has a retention time only of T 1 what are the issues I see that vinyl chloride concentration and 1 2 DC concentrations are relatively higher than their relevant standards which seem to be around 2 ppb right for the vinyl chloride and 1 2 DC. So, obviously by treating one problem I am creating more problems here right. So, obviously what do I need to do? I need to look for that particular time or the retention time or calculate that particular retention time that would allow for the relevant standards for all the relevant byproducts to be reached. So, here I guess we have T 3 uh, where it points out that the concentration of vinyl chloride is going to be 2 ppb which seems to be the standard for vinyl chloride is going to be reached. So, again the case is that am I going to design it for T 1? T 2 or T 3 obviously, I am going to design it for T 3 uh, as you see at T 3 all the relevant compounds are below the relevant uh, regulatory standards right. So, that is something that I need to consider yes again how can I get this done look at column feasibility study and compare the relevant uh, results to the relevant remediation not remediation the regulation goals let us say right and then you will choose the T C such that the byproduct or contaminant of concern has also been reduced right that is what we have out here. So, again PRB design objectives right what are the objectives obviously we want to be able to find a suitable location right suitable location and then orientation is important because obviously of the ground water flow direction yes orientation is important configuration are you going for continuous or funnel and gate and obviously PRB thickness that is the major aspect or one of the major aspects anyway and how do I get that based on kinetics let us say and the relevant byproducts or such which I would get from the column study right. So, first I would f uh, get the column study done and then find the relevant retention times right and then be able to reciprocate or replicate that part me in the relevant ground water right. And then obviously, width of PRB, width of PRB would typically be depend upon the width of the contaminated plume right. So, again what do we need in this context we need uh, what do we say with greater accuracy to be able to estimate the uh, contaminant uh, size and uh, plume distribution right. And obviously, we will need contaminant what we say monitoring wells and locations and some uh, frequencies of monitoring right. So, typically where are we going to have them we are going to have them upstream of the PRB downstream of the PRB at the sites of the PRB why at the sites of the PRB to see if any particular contaminant plume is escaping the relevant PRB and also within the PRB to see if the relevant rates or kinetics are being held as you would expect let us say right. So, we are going to look at some of these cases later right PRB modeling scenario. So, here we have a funnel and gate system right you know different models out here and the contaminated plume is flowing through the PRB that is what we see out here contaminated plume or which is the capture zone for this particular PRB anyway I guess right it is a capture zone. And as it moves through this particular PRB this is the top view obviously you have the treated water you know that is coming out and here we have the relevant PRB I believe. So, P gravel react to gate and P gravel again general cases not worth spending way too much time here, but uh, it will help you understand that. So, obviously the case as we talked about is that we need to address ground water flow uncertainties right. 
So again, uh, as we looked at it earlier, a case when we had recharge of the relevant aquifer and then the plume shifting uh, shape and direction and thus PRB performance, you know, not being optimum or failing, right. So obviously, what is the key? You need to be able to look for uncertainties. So side views, what are you concerned with? The groundwater flowing above or below the PRB, so that is something you are looking at. Plan view, you are concerned with the plume flowing around the PRB, right. So, this is the top view and earlier we looked at the side view. So, this can be different cases as in the porosity of this particular react to media let us say or your particular PRB is let us say lesser than the aquifer let us say and what would that lead to then you would have either uh, what do we say not either pardon me your water trying to take the path of least resistance and would prefer to move around the PRB right or let us say this can also be the case let us say the PRB there has been considerable uh, time let us say a few years and now the PRB or the relevant zero valent iron has precipitation let us say and now the porosity is lesser than what was the case earlier and then again uh, you have you might have failure of the PRB. So, that again needs to be taken into account when you are designing for the porosity of that particular PRB right. And obviously, let us say if you did not accurately estimate the width of the particular contaminated plume, the plume obviously might flow around this particular PRB right. And obviously, let us say the flux may be non-uniform as in you might have different strata creating variable velocity right as in here velocity and then shifting hydraulic gradients too I guess right. So, that can uh, lead to hydraulic gradients. So, the, there are different cases but again the key aspect is to be able to understand how the contaminant moves and what does that translate to how does groundwater, you know flow I guess right. So, moving on so addressing longevity issues what are the issues obviously as we mentioned geochemistry is and uh, something that we need to look at as in what are the typical aspects we need to look at oxygen concentration why is that if you have way too high oxygen concentration you are going to have relevant what we say uh, degradation of the zero valent iron right in the presence of oxygen which is an electron acceptor and then you are going to have the precipitate being formed or rushed or rusting in this case as you can call it right and this is going to obviously lead to relative inefficiencies in your PRB right or carbonate alkalinity again right that can lead to precipitation of either Fe2 plus Fe3 plus Ca2 plus or Mg2 plus and so on right you can have calcium and magnesium carbonates being formed or you know uh, precipitating out right and that can again uh, you know clog up your PRB right. So, you need to be looking at alkalinity and also the relevant calcium and magnesium concentrations and again sulphate concentration because sulphide formation on iron is something that is uh, that can lead to that can be led to as in you have SO4 2 minus reacting with zero valent iron you can have sulphide formation let us say right. So, that is one case sulphide formation again ligand S2 minus. So, in the presence of any other metals or such let us say uh, it can precipitate out again there are such issues these are the issues that you would look at when you consider the geochemistry of that particular site which would determine how long the system can uh, work fine let us say right. So, let us move on. So, what are the aspects that are you know driving uh, uh, the driving factors behind choosing for PRB obviously it is the economics right. Typically capital investment is less but you need to spend considerable amount though or you know a major fraction of it in site characterization, tradability, test and design again more importantly in site characterization as in you want to be able to capture the plume direction, groundwater flow direction and you know uncertainty is there and the aquifer characteristics considerably right or accurately and then obviously in getting the reactive medium and construction. So, we are going to look at the relevant data in the context of uh, what do we say the relevant aspects of uh, the case study as I mentioned we are going to look at a case study later and then we are going to look at all these aspects in greater detail and typically obviously you need to look at some monitoring cost for your uh, PRB right I mean you need to look at the monitoring cost for the groundwater, right and these are some aspects but obviously not major aspects though. And then if required let us say if you think uh, the reactive medium needs replacement or regeneration that needs to be looked at but typically most people uh, or you know most scenarios would not require that particularly as in if you need to regenerate or remove and replace your reactive medium. So, obviously the frequency at which you do that will, will uh, affect the longevity of your uh, uh, or will be depend upon how long your particular zero valent iron can say. Uh, has enough uh, active sites or such yes, but typically as we discussed earlier that is not requ required and typically iron medium could last for several years right. 
So, moving on again PRB economics, what are the issues that are driving it? So, no annual operating requirements, right? So, once I put it in, it is just a passive technique and only monitoring cost. So, unlike other cases, you know, there are no annual operating requirements. Majorly, I mean, major aspect, pardon me, uh, our major advantage in the Indian context is no above ground structures. So, especially when uh, you have groundwater contaminated in relatively high population density areas, PRBs depending upon obviously the site, let us say, and the extent of uh, depth of contamination is going to be something worthwhile. And again, obviously, you do not have any other waste streams being generated above ground, as in, I am not pumping water out, right? and I do not need to have a treatment train for that or now uh, be concer concerned about the waste from that particular treatment train, right. So, it is again passive everything is happening uh, below the uh, subsurface. So, these are the major uh, benefits obviously, right and monitoring we also obviously need to look at monitoring what are they. First to look at let us say two cases as in am I meeting the regulatory standards or not. Secondly to understand is my PRB working as I designed it to be, right. So, let us look at uh, what we have here. So, this is one particular hypothetical case. So, groundwater is flowing I believe in this direction, right. Yeah, groundwater flow is in this direction. So, I have funnel gate, right. I have the funnel walls here, right and the gate here. So, I guess pea gravel here relatively more porous, porous and then I have my reactive media here, right. So, this is the capture zone that is flowing in. So, obviously, I need relevant uh, monitoring wells here and I also need monitoring wells at the sides of the PRB to understand if any contaminated plume is flowing around the PRB, right and obviously at the funnel walls too before and after. And more importantly, I will also need them inside the PRB. Why do I need them inside the PRB? As I mentioned to understand the performance of the PRB as in I do not want to understand that the system has failed after it has failed. I will need to be able to predict the performance let us say. So, for that let us say I need to have relative monitoring wells or relevant monitoring wells within the PRB too. And obviously, I will need monitoring wells downstream and far downstream, right. So, let us look at another case, an actual case if I am not wrong, okay. So, this is an actual case and this is from Sunwell, California, okay. So, here let us look at what we have here. This is the plan view, right. This is the plan view or top view. So, groundwater is flowing in this direction. So, here they have used a funnel uh, and gate system if I can call that, but keep in mind that the shape of the funnel and gate can suit your particular site condition. So, this is a good example here as in this is my funnel right or the impermeable layer and what is that made of soil cement bentonite slurry wall let us say impermeable layer here. This is the top view obviously right and again similarly a funnel here right. So, this channels the groundwater flow towards my particular reactive media. So, here I have a particular uh, uh, monitoring well location, another monitoring well location out here which is uh, slightly away from the center line of the flow path and then right before the PRB and right after the PRB and obviously within the PRB. So, again as you can see in this case which is an actual site condition, they had a building out here, right and obviously with this type of structure you need not obviously keep these above surface uh, clear, right of uh, built up area, you can have built up area above the surface. So, that is what you see out here. So, now let us look at the relevant concentration profile here, right. So, concentration microgram or PPB on the y axis and this is the distance corresponding to this is at A, this is at B, this is at C and this is within the PRB and this is outside the PRB. So, obviously, at A you have the concentrations of the relevant compounds to be relatively high. What do we have? We have TCE, trichloroethylene and also vinyl chloride and 1,2 DCE, right. So, that is what we have here. Most of it is present looks like as 1,2 DCE, some as TCE and very little as vinyl chloride, right. So, again B, uh, but slightly off the center line of the uh, flow, groundwater flow that is why you see relatively less concentration, but C gives you a better picture of the true uh, concentration that is entering the reactor and that is what you see out here. Concentrations are remarkably high, right. So, obviously, as you see the concentration within the PRB is relatively less, right and this is the concentration outside the relevant uh, PRB or uh, as it exits the or after the relevant treatment, right. So, before treatment C naught and after treatment C T let us say, right. So, again uh, say a simple case when we can understand the relevant system based on the relevant monitoring results, right. So, uh, I guess I have spent enough time on this session. 
So in the next session we are going to look at the relevant technical aspects as in how do I design the relevant PRB, right? So we are going to look at let us say the plug flow model as in what is a plug flow now? Again we are going to again look, look at what is a plug flow and what are the different types of reactors and then apply mass balance and then model not model pardon me design the relevant uh, thickness of the uh, PRB, right? And then we will move on to looking at the case study, right? And I guess again as I said I am out of time and uh, thank you for today.